much of a choice. But the good news is most of today's agenda is testimony. We have uh, some really terrific people testifying, so uh, this will give us an opportunity to hear that testimony and to uh, share it uh, with our co-commissioners and um, pass along that information to the relevant working group. So since that's the bulk of our work tonight, um, I think that we'll still be able to, uh, to do that. So, so let's, uh, let's start off with introductions of the commissioners. Uh, Carmen, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Carmen Ketar. Member of the commission. Yes, thank you very much. Scott? Scott, can you introduce Scott. yourself, please? Yes. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I was Scott McDermott. <laughs> uh, Bopa, may. Uh, The, uh, Bopa, would you introduce yourself, please? Oh, yes, this is Bopa Malone. Also a member of the commission, uh, Jeff. Jeff Clements. Uh, I'm Bill Martin, a member of the commission. Uh, Costas Panagopoulos, a member of the commission, one of the co-chairs. Joy Sanchez, member of the commission. Noval Alexander, a member of the commission. Uh, so we have the one, two, three, four, five of us present. But three on the phone. Uh, and Cheryl the... Crawford's about to arrive. That was her on the phone. She's okay. right. That'll give us here six. Uh, and if we do end up with the necessary eight, then we will go into some of the agenda items which require a formal vote. Uh, but absent that, we will not review and approve the meeting, uh, the minutes of December. We will not be in a position to review and approve the minutes of the meeting of July 17th. Uh, we furthermore should probably refrain from reviewing and approving the workshop report back from August 19th. And it should probably go right to invited testimony from the public. Well, I think the first thing we want to do is uh, acknowledge uh, Suffolk University's generosity for hosting us. So, Jeff, would you like to introduce the representative? Um, yes, thank you. We're very glad to be in this uh, wonderful space here at Suffolk University. We've been all over the Commonwealth and you um, in, in hearings and meetings in, and workshops um, from Salem to Springfield to Framingham and you get a sense of the wonderful um, education and university systems we have in this, in this Commonwealth and right here in, in Boston, Suffolk is one of the, the, the greatest and kindest to us in, uh, in our community here um, with this wonderful space and so um, I've been here before under other auspices, and it always seems to be my friend Rob Whitney who makes it happen. So, Rob, would you mind saying a few words on behalf of Suffolk? Sure, if you could, to just grab a mic so folks can hear. I'll just sit. I'll, I'll look up there. In there. All right. Um, yes, yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. I am Rob Whitney. Um, I am an attorney at Soloway & Hollis here in Boston. It's a law firm. Um, my second week there, actually, so <laughs> it's a new job for me. But I'm very happy to be here. Um, when I had spoken with Jeff and you were looking for a space to hold this uh, hearing, I reached out to Suffolk University and specifically John Nucci, who is the Senior Vice President of External Affairs. And Suffolk University is a great uh, friend for community organizations in terms of offering their space whenever it's available, and they were very gracious in offering this space uh, to the commission. And I'll other than that, I won't speak on their behalf, except I'm sure that they're very happy you're here. Um, and I know if there's an opportunity in the future for them to also host another hearing, I'm sure, depending on the scheduling available, they would, they would uh, look forward to seeing you again. Um, and since I'm here, Jeff uh, gave me the opportunity, because I have to leave a little early tonight, to offer sort of a brief public comment, if I could. Um, uh, in addition to other hats I wear, uh, I am also the president of the Boston Lawyer Chapter of the American Constitution Society. 
And as uh, most people here know, the American Constitution Society has been a longtime opponent of the Citizens United decision um, and supports the process of exploring the possibility of enacting a, a campaign finance reform amendment of some kind uh, to the United States Constitution to authorize greater restrictions on spending relating to, related to political speech and to overturn the Supreme Court rulings, which have narrowed such laws under the First Amendment. Several, as we all know, several amendments have already been filed since the Citizens United uh, versus Federal uh, Election Commission case. I think I counted at least six here in Congress, if I'm not mistaken. Um, interestingly, while the Citizens United is a Supreme Court case most cited by advocates of the campaign finance reform, actually the underlying precedent, as we know, is extends further into the past, back into what some of us historian, legal historians refer to as the Lochner era where basically constitutional rights began to be expended whole in, in whole form to corporate corporations under the corporate, uh, read my own thing here, personhood doctrine rooted in a century of Supreme Court decisions. As a result, while some of the proposed amendments have been narrowly drawn, focusing mostly on the First Amendment issues, there are others that are broader in scope. One such uh, one that I've looked at, the People's Rights Amendment, is a proposed limit to limit the Constitution's protections only to rights of natural persons and not corporations. This amendment would overturn the United States decision in Citizens United and actually goes pretty further than that and sort of evaluates the issue of whether corporations are really natural persons entitled to other constitutional rights as well. Um, on behalf of our local chapter, um, I, we look forward to following this process and we anticipate uh, and look forward to reviewing the report that we know, at least in first, in first draft, will come out in December of this year. And uh, we also look forward to being involved in the process going forward. And thanks for the opportunity to give my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see my alma mater. I got a master's degree from Suffolk. Is, uh, is contributing to the community. Uh, do we have Senator uh, Jenny Lyons on the phone, Sam? Is she ready to offer her commentary? Sam, are you there? Okay, so we'll wait for... Uh, okay, uh, so as we're waiting for uh, Senator Lyons, Sean, do you want to go next? Sure. Sean Curran? Uh, please welcome Sean Curran, who has accepted an invitation to offer his perspective on the issues. Sean, if you just, you know, identify yourself where you live and would be delighted to hear your opinion. Sure. Sean Curran from Sudbury, Massachusetts. Uh, I want to thank the commission for inviting me to offer a perspective on money and politics. I have been either directly involved with electoral politics in official capacities or indirectly as a fundraiser for 26 years. I've served as chairman of a campaign committee for a sitting governor and as chair of a federal political action committee. I've raised money for and contributed money to many Democratic candidates for office, be they candidates for city council, statewide offices, or federal offices. Today I'd like to talk with the commission about how our current system does not result in the kind of government people deserve. If we were to present an idealized vision for an elected official in our democracy, perhaps the person would have the following characteristics. He or she would be dedicated steadfastly to the truth, committed to research and data to support public decisions, uh, having the capability and judgment to balance the needs of industry and the larger public with an eye always toward what is ultimately better for society, and that person would be accessible to the people he or she represents. Because money has such a dominant role in our politics, the idealized vision I described is far too rare. The truth is substituted for by loud assertion. Data is subjective. The powerful and connected trump the ordinary citizen, and an elected official must spend time with donors, live and on the phone, for more time than they can spend with the people they represent. I see all of these things as the little corruptions of our system. When combined, they result in the subversion of representative democracy, and it puts a dangerous distance between the governed and those they elect. But we need to fix it. Of all the issues we confront as a society, be it climate change, issues of foreign policy, or health care, 
Money has an outsized role in the way these issues are debated and unfortunately settled. All of what I have discussed here so far relates to cam candidate campaign committees. One bright spot, obviously, with candidate committees is that there are legal limits on how much an individual can give, and public disclosure of donors and expenditures is present in some form or fashion in most states. These laws are intended to limit the influence of money on the decisions made by candidates and elected leaders and to enable the public to draw conclusions about who might be influencing them. Then came Citizens United. The Citizens United ruling is not something I am qualified to discuss from a constitutional law perspective, but I can speak to how it is impacting our politics and the fundraising that supports both candidates for public office and issue campaigns. There are many ways to form an independent expenditure committee, independent expenditure committee, or an IE. In short, most IEs are set up with a nonprofit tax classification and are required to hew to the letter of the law about the types of activities they engage in, the amount of time they engage in those activities, and whether they need to disclose their donors and donations. The most prevalent of the IEs and what the Citizens United ruling gave rise to is the 527 Super PAC. Classified in the tax code under Section 527 as a nonprofit, these PACs and Super PACs can raise money for direct political activities. Traditional PACs have been with us for decades, and the FEC requires reporting of their donors and limits giving to 5,000 per year. Super PACs are not constrained by donation limits, as most of you know or the sources of their, for their donations. Exploitation of the various tax classifications is not limited to Section 527, however. Even 501c3s, which the public thinks of as a classification for charities, have gotten into politics by exploiting a loophole that allows for voter education and get out the vote drives. A 501c3 nonprofit cannot by law spend more than roughly 25% of its money or time on direct advocacy for an issue. This type of IE is typically set up to provide public education. 501c3s are not always required to disclose the source of their donation to the public, and many do not. 501c4s allow for 50% of the activities to be in the realm of advocacy. These rules on their face seem reasonable and straightforward, however, through the years, I have seen campaign finance laws written, passed, and exploited because of discovered or designed loopholes. Allow me to provide a hypothetical example of how 501c4 can violate the spirit of the law and influence an election. Imagine a powerful House chairman from a congressional committee that oversees drug pricing. He has always been a strong industry advocate and favors market-only approaches to controlling drug costs. The industry loves the chairman. They love the chairman so much that when he is up for re-election, its trade association develops a 501c4 called Healthcare for Americans and sets it up to provide the public with information about the positions and voting record of members and candidates for Congress. They begin by hiring researchers and lay out a series of reports about the various candidates challenging the favored chairman. The reports are not advocating a vote in the coming election for the chairman, because they are only meant to enlighten the public as to what the citizens behind Healthcare for Americans think about the positions taken. Meanwhile, all of the companies that make up the membership of the Industry Association are assessed how much they will contribute to Healthcare for Americans. Some, depending on size, are assessed as much as a million apiece. Healthcare for Americans coffers swell to 40 million. For good measure, a couple of the CEOs from the bigger players in the industry throw a million dollars each in bringing the total to 50 million. Based on the conservative 75 to 25 percent rule of education activities to direct advocacy, this could mean that Healthcare for Americans has 12.5 million to spend on direct mail, field operations, and television ads that further educate the public on the voting records and plans of the two candidates. This number is twice the amount that ordinary members of Congress raise and spend. From the summer into the fall, the public would be bombarded with television ads from Healthcare for Americans that carefully walks the line between outright praise for the chairman and simple voter education. If any curious citizen were to inquire as to who is really behind Americans for Healthcare, that person would be told good people just like you that prefer to remain anonymous. I want the commission to know that this type of exploitation is happening right now. The collection of unlimited amounts of money from unnamed sources to influence our elections or a public decision is happening right now. 
I hope that in your discussions, you can get into ways to curb this and other activities that undermine our de democracy. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, John. We, we, we have a copy of your comments. Sure. Uh, questions, comments from the Thank you very much uh, for your uh, thoughtful testimony. Uh, I'm curious in your experience in this field if you have no... Uh, I'm fine. Yeah, we can we can do a quick a quick round of yeah, questions, okay. maybe just a few minutes. Uh, I'm curious in your experience um, if you have found that, um, well, let's call them individuals or small donors, and by small I even mean the maxed out regulated donors, direct donors to contribution. If you believe that they are uh, receiving less attention from candidates and elected officials in the aftermath of Citizens United than they would receive uh, before? No, I don't think less attention. I, you know, if, if you take the, the, the kind of week that a member of Congress has, that member of Congress is spending 40% of their time dialing for dollars with donors. And so I think donors are cultivated. Uh, those donors that are um, in the realm of the max out donor, especially in the, by the federal uh, standards, which is 5,800 mm -hmm. per election cycle between um, primary and general election. Those types of donors are maintained uh, in a way that they've all become kind of accustomed to. Mm -hmm. They're invited to retreats with the member. They are invited to you know, special events with the member. They get a birthday call mm -hmm. from the member. Yeah. Those are the types of things, frankly, that are, as I said in my testimony, are those, those mini corruptions because everybody that is elected that particular member of Congress should have an expectation that they're being studious about public policy, talking to their constituents, and going and representing them directly. Um, when they're on the phone offering birthday wishes to $5,800 $5, per cycle donors, that's, that is taking away from the work that they should be doing. And I don't even think that the candidates themselves, the members, the ones that are dedicated, want to do this. But they have no choice. Uh, for, uh, that's basically the, the dominant paradigm is that they have no choice. Can I ask a follow-up on that, um, which is related? So we're referring now to, you talked about the ways you can get unlimited money if you had unlimited money to spend, whether it's a super PAC, right. the 501c3 or 4 method. But if I were... Uh, a donor, and I had done all that, and I said, well, don't worry about that. That's, we'll, we'll take care of the super PAC, but you know, I feel constrained that I can only give you, member, $5,800. I want to help control Congress so I can get my agenda through. Mm -hmm. But I only want to write one check. Keep it simple. Right. <laughs> Even where there's supposedly limits, how much could I give with just one check to have influence with a party, with the Congress, with the office holder. Yep. Are there ways that that happens? Yeah, so special funds are set up through the party apparatus. Um, you'll see it happen during a presidential election where you can write a check for $250,000, one single check for $250,000. It goes to a member. That member then gives it to the, to the party, and the party has a distribution chain where that money goes to. So a single check is written, but the financial distribution goes to state party op operations, uh, other parts of the, of, the, of the national party operations, uh, field operations, what have you. Um, so there are, they do create um, these kind of opportunities, I'll call them, for single donors to write a very, very large check, and it typically happens during presidential years. So even if the limit is $2,800 for a single donor, if I were to call, say, a prominent committee chair or even the top, you know, Senate president, Senate majority leader, or on the other side, House speaker, and I was one of those who'd written a $250,000 check, would I have any trouble getting a meeting with the top, right up to the top, to the Senate majority leader or the House speaker? Well, I think you know the answer to that is uh, no, you would not have any problem probably getting that meeting. If you were doing that number, you are likely having six or seven uh, opportunities to meet with the House Speaker uh, over the course of the year. There'd be a, a retreat. You know, they do a, they do a, a retreat to Greenbrier in... in uh, That's a resort in West Virginia? Yes, a resort in West Virginia where they invite major donors, f folks that have kind of hit that top, that top level. 
Um, and so you're going to have plenty of opportunities, some of which will be just in a, in a standard social setting, and others, if you wanted them, in, in an official setting in the, in the, in the, in the Congress. Is there, is there anything you could say about the extent or degree to which candidates and elected officials work behind the scenes to cultivate these uh, unlimited or large-scale donations funneled through IEs rather than, say, focusing on the regulated, uh, uh, re restricted, uh, smaller amounts uh, directly to their campaigns? Yeah, I think, I think in, in the course, especially of a presidential year or in a year where we're in a, we're in a off cycle election. Perfect example is 2018. Um, members are asked by the party, or in the case of House members, the DCCC or the RCCC, uh, to help support the speaker's effort with the Democratic side or the minority leader's uh, effort on the Republican side um, to get money out to, you know, districts where there's a difficult election. Mm -hmm. And so the speaker will travel all over the country and regional finance staff will set up events. And in those events, those larger checks are transacted basically. And the member that is hosting that event with, whether it's Speaker Pelosi or, or, um, or uh, the minority leader on the Republican side, those members get credit for bringing in those checks. Any other uh, questions from the members of the commission or those on the phone? Um, I was one question. You just said about some about credit. So what does that entail? Well, I, I think in the seniority system um, in the Congress, I think uh, when you are working on behalf of leadership so that you strengthen leadership's position with the members by helping to support the election or re-election of members that are um, in, the, in the leadership or close to the leadership, it helps your career. Can I try to just bring it back to the um, <coughs> mini corruption and the distance between the governed and the governed that you referred to so interestingly? And we had a, a, um, a member of the public at our last public workshop in Salem who had a lot of um, information and expertise around uh, impacts on lakes and water of chemicals and environmental issues. And she used the phrase, um, I feel like I have tape over my mouth. I have no way, no one to tell mm -hmm. about this information. No one listens. I can't get a meeting. Um, and it, it's, obviously, she's not going to be at the Greenbrier with no. the Senate president and the, and the Senate majority leader and the House speaker. Is, 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 is that a free speech issue? I mean, no, apart from the constitutional law aspects of the First Amendment, when people talk about unlimited money being free speech, right. um, how do you feel about th that in terms of people saying they have tape over their mouth? They should, maybe they should just call you and get one of those uh, <laughs> one of those meetings set up and drop their two hundred fifty thousand dollar check. But obviously, most people, most Americans, can't do that, right? Right. Well, I won't say it's the good news because, frankly, it's not good news at all. But that person's perspective is represented by other major donors too. Um, you know, I remember in Massachusetts a couple of years ago, there was an independent expenditure set up um, by the chairman of the Sierra Club here. So he was the local regional chair of the Sierra Club. He happened to be a very wealthy individual and he decided to put his own radio ads up in the middle of a gubernatorial election to kind of force the issue about the environment being an important part. So it's not just the polluter side. Both sides actually can have outsized impact on the politics of the day. Um, it's a question of money. Um, and I don't like the, the fact that our system tends to cater to the well-connected, cater to the wealthy, and cater to big corporate interests, or interests that are, happen to be well-moneyed, whether they're, whether they're left or right. Um, I would love the ideal to be true, which is, you elect people to public office who want to strike a balance between all the things that are in the realm of public policy and come out with what's best for society. So I don't like that that person feels that way. I understand why she does or he does. Um, would you support limits on spending, whether it's contributions, independent spending, um, whatever the source, unions, corporations, individuals? Yeah. So I would support a total elimination of any political activity with any 501c3 or c4, 
100% across the board. The loopholes that are there are giving way to all sorts of uh, treachery in my, in my book. Um, I, fi you know, 527 super PACs are, uh, have done such damage to our democracy that I would like to see it overturned, obviously, <laughs> and I'd like an, an amendment to do that, and that's why I'm here to support it. Um, but in terms of candidates, uh, my preference would be for a threshold system very similar to what Connecticut does with state legislators, which is once you have shown you can get enough small dollar donations that you're a viable candidate, then the state will step up with some money and publicly fund you at some level uh, in those campaigns. And you know, $100 is within the realm of what people can, can manage. Uh, at least it touches different demographics than what the current system seems to touch. The commission obviously finds this very, very interesting, but in the interest of time, I, I think we should move on. Is there any final questions? Uh, thank you again, Sean. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is Senator Lyons ready? Yes, she's I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. Curran, could you s email me a copy of your statement? And I'll ask that of all the witnesses just for our uh, reporting. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, this is Senator Lyons. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Uh, yes, yeah. we can. Hello, we hear uh, you loud and clear. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for um, inviting me to speak, and I, I look forward to offering some comments. I think I will. I don't have a full prepared speech. Uh, I can certainly send you my comments in writing should you wish that, but I think we might. it might be best to um, give an introduction and then allow for you to ask some questions and discuss uh, the Vermont process. Of course, um, the framers of the U.S. Constitution intended that constitutional rights be granted to, to individuals and to the people. Um, I've been involved in government for many years. I was chair of my select board, which is sort of a, like being the mayor of the town, for about 15 years. and. During that time, I came to understand what it means to govern and to be governed. I am a biologist and a professor by trade, and my biggest concern in the Senate, uh, in the Vermont Senate, over the past 20 years has been in climate change and uh, renewable energy legislation, as well as health care and health care legislation. I'm currently chair of the Health and Welfare Committee. I was previously chair of the Natural Resources and Energy Committees. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but a democratic government of, by, for, and of the people is critically important. And I think the First Amendment, of course, you know, guarantees free speech and a free press. The Supreme Court on January 21st, 2010, in its Citizens United decision, equated free speech with corporate spending on political campaigns. And while the economy might benefit from business success, democracy benefits when individual voices are heard. Democracy is forever, forever altered when corporate economic power can silence individual voices within the democratic process. By allowing corporations to give unlimited dollars to political campaigns, to market positive or negative political ads, the Supreme Court undermines our democratic heritage. The unfettered infusion of money into the electoral process leads to a loss of transparency, so important to open elections. A local resolution was passed in, uh, by, uh, I, we went through a process um, in 2011, and I worked with representatives from a number of organizations. I worked with legislators, local legislators across the state and we, uh, between um, the end of November and the beginning of January, we met several times. There was a group of about 25 or 30 people, uh, just local citizens and legislators. And I think that was really it. There weren't really any um, nonprofit organizations or others represented. And we drafted a, uh, a resolution that we wanted to send to our congressional delegation. And that resolution was passed in 2012. 
um, the resolution simply asked the Congress, our congressional delegation, to please initiate um, uh, legislation or constitutional amendment to um, overturn Citizens United. After following that, um, there was really um, not much that happened. <laughs> As you know, not much has happened. Um, and we, we in 20, 2013, we invited Lawrence Lessig to come to Vermont for a weekend, and we called it the Mountain Meadow uh, meetings. During that time, we met with a, the group of people, and we expanded the group a little bit. And we talked about the need for an Article 5 uh, process to initiate a constitutional amendment that would effectively overturn Citizens United. Of course, there were other Supreme Court decisions that intervened during that time so that it made it even more compelling for us to do that. Um, so at that time, we, we, after meeting with um, Lawrence Lessig, we drafted another um, resolution, JRS 27, and we had um, strong support in the Senate. I have to say, um, it wasn't easy to draft a resolution asking for a constitutional amendment. It was with fear and trepidation that I personally went in that direction because I was unfamiliar with the process and I think that many of the people in the room with whom I was working, citizens, were also unfamiliar and not certain what the outcome would be. So we educated ourselves uh, about the process. And as the um, resolution was passed, one of the best things that happened to us uh, in that process was that we became aware of the Wolf Pack, and they helped us understand the um, – the, the importance of educating the public about what Article 5 actually means, how it happens, uh, the number of states that would be involved, and so on. So at, at a very simplistic level, at a very simplistic level, um, we brought people together. We, we had a press conference. We passed our resolution. The... the um, the leaders in the Senate were supportive of the resolution. So the chair of judiciary, the chair of our um, committee that oversees election law and others all signed on to the resolution. So it was a process. So uh, in Vermont, it was simply a, a real grassroots and by grassroots, I mean citizen grassroots um, process to bring the resolution uh, to fruition. Um, Following the passage of the resolution, we and we we had support from one of our senators, Senator Sanders, who was very excited about it. Um, and then, after uh, I would say another three or four months or five months after we passed the resolution, Senator Lay spoke out in favor of um, changing the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. In the meantime, we had legislation that was passed to regulate um, corporate donations and um, election donations in the state. That law was deemed unconstitutional um, by the federal courts and went no further. So at this point, um, the resolution stands. It is one of, I, I forget how many, 19 resolutions that now have been passed by other states, 19 states. Vermont, I think, was number one. Um, we, I think, did bring attention through our initial resolution in 2012 and then um, this one in 2014. Um, the, in 2017, we had a, an interesting dilemma uh, one of our more progressive senators decided that we should withdraw this resolution. And the reason that he gave for withdrawing the resolution, I think, was a total misunderstanding of Article 5 process. So um, uh, his concern was that 
all it would take would be any set of resolutions asking for the constitutional amendment from 33 states. So you could have 33 diverse requests. It wouldn't simply be to overturn Citizens United. It might be for the balanced budget or something else. Um, and so uh, the um, we we worked very hard to um, remind people that that is not the case. So that's a little bit about the process that happened in Vermont. Um, I'm sorry to, that it sounds a little bit disorganized or simplistic, but the reality is it's not, it's all about people. Our state is a microcosm of other states. We don't have as many large corporations as you might in Massachusetts. We do have a multinational corporations. We have um, global foundries on one side. We might have Ben and Jerry's. We've got um, Curie Coffee. Uh, we have, and, and others who um, work throughout um, the globe. But we also have a commitment to our democratic values. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I think about consistently when I think about this issue is how it was a bubble up grassroots endeavor. One of the first places in the state to come forth and support our initial resolution was a small town outside of Middlebury, Vermont called Ripton. And that town just stepped right forward and they, the citizens voted on that resolution very quickly. That followed with um, over 20% of the towns in the state supporting the resolution. That, uh, we, and remember, we had a very short time to get it up before the voters. I think we had less than a month to do that, but we did it. So um, we know that over 80% of the people in this country believe that the Citizens United decision is important or very important to be overturned. We know that. And I think that um, we all support our businesses. We support our corporations. We do not want to have economic devastation. But we also don't want to have a democratic, a devastation of our democracy. As an elected official, I fully understand my role, and I fully understand that I, am, I should not be dictated to by any uh, organization or corporation. And uh, so when we raise money in Vermont, um, some of us are probably pretty careful about limiting the donations that we get from uh, from corporations, but that's that's voluntary. So, um, just a personal perspective there. Um, I, I guess I'd open it up for questions. Um, it sounds like you've had a lot of information coming to you from uh, lawyers and others who understand the um, the legal and constitutional process. Uh, I. As a scientist, uh, it, I tend to be conservative in the way I make decisions, and uh, I was very conservative in how I made this decision. It wasn't easy for me to move to a uh, belief that constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United is what we should be doing, and yet um, I'm, I believe that I, as well as um, millions of others in our country, believe that we should do this. Our, our laws are turned aside too frequently, as they were in the Citizens United case, um, to leave it to a legislative process. And with the dysfunction that we currently have in Congress, um, regardless of who's in charge, I will, we're not going to see an alteration to Citizens United decision. Um, the, I did notice in the referendum of the, that went out to the voters of the state that the pro side didn't say anything about Citizens United, but the con side did, but it was supporting um, free speech. <laughs> I'm not sure that Citizens United supports free speech. It supports open and free giving of funds. So um, I guess I'd say questions. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, no way. This is Costas Panagopoulos, one of the commissioners. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I, I was wondering the extent to which uh, you engaged in any um, efforts to coordinate with other states or other uh, or en entities or groups or activists in other states in your efforts, and whether you found that helpful in your initiatives in Vermont, or if you uh, just focused almost entirely on what was happening within the state. Well, that's a really good question. Um, you, you know, we, for, as we started the process, it was really a, a, a startling decision. And so the reaction in the state was one, uh, was that. There were people were just startled by the decision. So um, as, as I put the resolution together with folks, one of the groups that did uh, come forward was the, the Wall Street group. Remember them? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the Wall Street group? Occupy. No. Occupy. Occupy, yes. Um, they came forward and supported this, and I was really surprised. Uh, the group that we, that we ended up working with was Wolfpack. They were excellent. They, they actually came in as we were passing our resolution and helped to, um, to reword the resolution in committee uh, to provide us with information about um, making, a, uh, making the language so that it could uh, be supported in other states. I did talk with um, folks from other states, but we didn't really, you know, I can't say that our focus was outside of the state of Vermont. It was really focused inward. Thank you. Other questions from the commission or those on the phone? Well, I had one. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Lyons. The, You'd indicated up to 80% of the people uh, would be in favor of overturning Citizens United. Could you comment about the source of that data? Well, I think that came from a couple of places. Uh, I think Move to Amend, oh, I should go back and say that uh, David Cobb of Move to Amend did come into the state. <laughs> and uh, we did have a, we did have a, um, a couple of... Uh, uh, workshops where he talked and um, that data did uh, would probably have come from that group or from Wolfpack itself. We didn't conduct any surveys across the country to develop that information. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the Senator? Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, Noel. yeah. Um, thank you, Senator, for um, your testimony. Um, one of my questions is um, I always like to look at the other side of things. So I'm curious to see how, what was your opposition in the state of Vermont, uh, if any? Uh, like describe who, who might have come out and, and why. I think you alluded to um, some opposition of, uh, if, as far as like uh, uh, free speech uh, proponents, but can you just uh, touch upon your, the opposition and and what you believe that their uh, um, their platform was? Yeah. Yes. Um, so just going back a little bit, um, the ACLU national organization uh, had drafted um, uh, a statement against having uh, the, uh, a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. The, the ACLU felt that it was, uh, you know, contrary to First Amendment rights. And I believe that that has since changed. I haven't kept up with their position. Uh, but that was really the only one. But are the, peop the, the organization, the in-state organization in Vermont was very much supportive. So it, it was fairly, in it was interesting uh, to see that difference of opinion. The... The real pushback that we got from wasn't really from groups, um, and it wasn't from business. Uh, it was from folks who, uh, maybe it was, I don't know, promulgated the arguments, but um, it was really about uh, stating that Article 5 convention would become dysfunctional and um, 
and not focused. So it could be any issue that would be taken up. Um, so that that's really where the pushback was. And so having having had upfront concrete information was critically important for people out in communities when uh, local resol- the local resolution was passed and then in the state house for individual members so that that argument um, didn't uh, win. Um, but that was really it. Uh, there weren't, uh, there weren't businesses pushing back against this. In fact, um, some of our, the, at that time, IBM was in the state. Now they've since sold their, uh, work, their, um, offices to global foundries, but members of the IBM community and the administration there in that organization were supportive of uh, Citizens United. The reason that they gave, I'm, now I'm giving you the positive, not the negative, but the reason that they gave was that uh, many corporations are sick and tired of this. Why should they have to put all this money out? Uh, into elections and become extremely competitive. Uh, so, so they were. So we didn't get the pushback from businesses that one would expect. It was really fascinating. Um, and I, uh, to be honest with you, I cannot think of another group that spoke out contrary uh, to this. Um, and I, I traveled a bit, a bit. I gave I gave some talks uh, for the bar association that was organized by the law school, and some others. And there were some lawyers who said uh, pushed back about the Article Five uh, process. But again, that's something that can be argued logically. So um, that argument didn't win out either. Oh, thank you. Any other? Uh, yeah. Any other questions from members of the commission, uh, those in present or those on the phone? Okay, uh, thank you very thank much, you. Senator. Uh, I think we're ready to move on. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wish you well in this endeavor. Um, how many members of your commission are actually legislators? One. Yeah, so... It's interesting, isn't it? Um, our government is made up of elected officials, and I, I, I'm, I just caution you about acting negatively um, on making this recommendation. I think it's it is one of the most critical things that you could recommend to do for our democracy. And having seen what's happening at the federal level most recently, it's really time for our democracy to be returned to the people. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Sam, I think Russell Kaplan wanted to come on at 6 o'clock. Is that uh, correct? He's running a little late. We should move on. I know that uh, okay. the witness from the Austin. Gun Rights Organization is eager to get home very soon. Okay. We have a couple invited. Uh, I'm sorry, who was that? The gentleman from Sure. Well, that's not an invited testimony, so we will stick with the invited testimonies first. Um, about Senator Rubens? Yeah. Uh, Senator Rubens, do you want to come in next? Thank you, members of the commission. Uh, name is Jim Rubens from Hanover, New Hampshire. A little bit of background. I was a former state senator, Republican, uh, representing District 5 in New Hampshire. I ran for United States Senate as a Republican in the primary in the years 2014 and 2016, lost those primaries. I was a former chairman of the GOP platform committee in New Hampshire. I have, uh, I'm a member, I'm the chairman of the board for Take Back Our Republic, uh, forgive me, the uh, chairman of the New England uh, Division of Take Back Our Republic, the leading conservative organization favoring campaign reform. I've just joined the board of American Promise, working on uh, a 28th Amendment. I have uh, testified in a significant number of states all over the country, uh, mostly red states, in favor of, uh, for, on behalf of various organizations uh, uh, 
on behalf of uh, passage of the 28th Amendment, either, either by the state-led amending process, the Article 5 state-led amending process, or uh, encouraging Congress, as American Promise is working on, uh, encouraging Congress to draft the language to be sent back to the states for potential ratification. Uh, and I'm going to speak about why Republicans support the 28th Amendment you, through either of the two paths, either of the two Article 5 pathways. And I'll just, uh, I'm going to talk about five reasons, which are a subset of the reasons that might. Uh, might uh, explain why Republicans support this. The first one is uh, the threat to capitalism, free market capitalism. And you can see the, uh, the shape of the 2020 presidential uh, and national elections is being shaped by Republicans into a contest between the preservation of capitalism and the growing support among the public for some form of socialism, capitalism versus socialism. And my view is, and the view of many Republicans is, Capitalism is being supplanted by crony capitalism, where large organizations, particularly business organizations, in order to meet the needs of their shareholders and their corporate objectives, have to go out and buy policy from Congress. And they do that because they're forced to do it by being extorted by members of Congress who will uh, threaten to uh, threaten a particular bill which is adverse to a particular industry in order to elicit campaign contributions which result in the, the, uh, the removal of that bill from the legislative calendar, or they give money to buy policy. So, so increasingly, free market uh, capitalism replaced by crony capitalism, companies will go to Washington, buy, buy politics through a, a process of lobbying and campaign contributions in order to get special contracts in order to get uh, tax benefits, in order to get uh, 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 contracts, in order to uh, get their needs met. And the result of this is the public is aware of this now. The public is aware we don't have free market capitalism anymore. We have companies going to Washington uh, feathering their nests. The result of this is that we have less competition, reduced innovation, reduced new business formation, and the flow of products and services, innovative products and services to consumers in the United States is being suppressed by this process. Capitalism, free market capitalism, the engine of prosperity globally, uh, which has been husbanded here in the United States of America, is under, under threat. And so we, we see in opinion polling over the last couple of years, uh, young people, a, a majority of young people now have a favorable impression about socialism. Uh, Non-white voters have a favorable impression of, uh, of socialism and a disfavoring uh, impression about, about capitalism. So, so for Republicans who want to protect and preserve free market capitalism as distinguished from crony capitalism, this process, this process of big money buying, <laughs> buying candidates and buying, buying policy in Congress is, is a threat to a, to a fundamentally important uh, goal, uh, structure, uh, supported by, by conservatives and Republicans, and I no doubt Democrats too. So that's an item, one, item number two uh, that causes uh, conservatives and Republicans to support a 28th Amendment is the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. We hear a lot about the First Amendment. Uh, the 10th Amendment reserves to the states and to the people respectively all powers not express, uh, expressly delegated to Congress. What we see now Big money is now federalizing elections across the country. You see swing races both for U.S. Senate, uh, the couple I was involved in, and swing races for Congress are targeted by people in New York and San Francisco, people billionaires. They target the swing races. They go as far as selecting candidates, importing them into states. You can import a U.S. Senate candidate into a state without any, any residency requirement uh, <laughs> uh, prior to the time when they announced their camp campaign. And the result of this is elections uh, are no longer being, even, even the selection of candidates, and the viability of candidates is no longer being governed and run by the people who live in the state and the people purportedly represented by the candidates. So, so you see elections and issues being federalized and made more uniform, uniform among the 50 states. And so the 
huge benefits in our Constitution, the framers of our Constitution, wanted laboratories of democracy where states would be empowered to solve their individual problems in ways that might best meet the need of that particular state. And what might work in Massachusetts might not work as well in New Hampshire. And then states can look at the various approaches taken by the states and states that have figured out a way to solve policy problems better other states can look at that and mimic it or replicate it. So the, the, the benefits of the Tenth Amendment are being suppressed and even eliminated in swing districts around the country by this big money system, this corrupt big money system. So that's item number two. And I, I, I testified recently uh, in Pennsylvania to the leadership of both the House and Senate in Pennsylvania. We're run by conservatives. Both, both bodies are run by conservatives. And I described this problem with the Tenth Amendment and, and in, in, in both cases, leadership in the House and Senate side rose up out of their chair angry that someone in San Francisco had picked candidates in various districts, not just at the, for federal races, but for state-level races, for state-level races, people in San Francisco determining who viable candidates for the state Senate would be, rose up out of their chair uh, bothered by this. So, so conservatives bothered by, the, by this process. Number three. Uh, another reason that conservatives and Republicans uh, support increasingly a 20th Amendment is in the past, Republicans have been better at the dark money game than Democrats. And this changed in the year 2018. 2018, uh, Democrats wised up and <coughs> no longer wanted to be outgunned, outplayed by, by, by Republicans uh, in this game, and now have, in 2018 data, more money and uh, using it better than, than Republicans. So in New Hampshire, we have seen this in the 2018 elections. Our House and our State Senate, our State House and our State Senate were taken over by Democrats as a result of outside money, and uh, we heard some testimony about large sums of money being amalgamated, outside money coming in, and changing the nature of our own in-state uh, legislative leadership. And these are people from out of state uh, so the GOP, uh, we've discovered, no longer has an edge in this process. Item number four uh, is their progressives are motivated uh, for the 28th Amendment on the basis of certain issues, maybe health care, maybe other issues, maybe uh, I income inequality, maybe immigration. There are issues that motivate Republicans and conservatives uh, that are being blocked. And I'll just name one of them, which is the debt problem. The United States government is deeply in debt and getting into debt at a rate of a trillion dollars a year. I personally link that, that problem in Congress with this corrupt campaign money system. Again, it ties back to crony capitalism, uh, companies seeking to feather their nest and get, get production contracts or uh, contracts from the government or tax breaks. They don't really care about the general interest in having a stable currency and stable long-term uh, stable long-term inflation. Uh, and, and I believe this corrupt big money process results in the more rapid than otherwise accretion of debt by the United States government. And last item, very simple one, a recent poll, 66% of Republican voters back this 28th Amendment process. Two-thirds of Republican voters back this. Uh, the number is higher among progressives and Democrats, but when you have two out of three uh, members of the party that's supposed to be more concerned about not doing this, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it illustrates why this change will happen. Don't know when, but it will happen. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate your testimony, and, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me for, for putting you on the spot, but we don't often get um, elected officials, former elected officials, maybe with the luxury of now having been a former elected official. I would just ask you honestly, um, as a candidate and as a former elected official, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't ask the direct question of, did you ever find yourself in a position to have been corrupted by donors or contributions, but did you feel pressure to act a certain way because you were working with either cultivating a donor or because you were aware of a contribution? Did you feel uh, pressure to vote a particular way? Uh, of course, but uh, my, my personality, it was irrelevant, yeah. completely Thank irrelevant you. to me. Thank you, I appreciate the yeah. honest answer. Now yeah. let me ask you, yeah. would you have felt greater pressure 
for someone who had given a bigger contribution? In other words, was the degree of pressure tantamount to the level of the contribution? Yeah. I'll, I'll answer in the way that uh, most people will answer. Uh, people give me large sums of money because they agree with my positions. They don't, they have no influence over my position. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear that type of answer yes. very frequently. That's one of the biggest problems we're trying to disentangle the effects of, of corporate money in politics is because yeah. it's hard to know whether candidates and elected officials yeah. are getting contributions because yeah. they believe in these positions already or because right. uh, those are causing them yeah. to, to uh, vote a certain way. Yeah, I think you can, uh, I think you can look at the 2014-2015 uh, the Princeton study that you're probably all familiar with, uh, uh, distinguishing the relative influence of average voters and the relative influence of big money sources, primarily large businesses. Are you familiar with yes. that? All, this is Marty Gilman's book. Familiar with that, that study? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> that that's good quality evidence that large sums of money can impact on policy. Just uh, yesterday, in yesterday's uh, newspaper, uh, The Intercept published a uh, a story about uh, <clears throat> two individual members of Congress, one of whom is now a U.S. Senator, were given $1.4 million to put forward a bill to handcuff the Drug Enforcement Administration and present, prevent them, prevent the DEA from uh, fingering and slowing down the, uh, the excess distribution of opioids. This is back several years ago. Uh, we now, that know we, in hindsight, we know, and even then we knew that opioids were killing people. So two members of Congress, <laughs> given a million four, uh, drug distributors like McKesson, a couple of other companies, we don't know all of them, uh, wrote the bill. The bill got passed, signed by President Obama. Obama, President Obama has no, uh, had no comment about this story. Uh, that's the type of example we can talk about where, where money, but now did these two members of Congress genuinely believe it's good for pill mills to give tremendous amounts of opioids to communities in West Virginia? I don't think so. But I can tell you from my personal experience, this, this big money process, because I'm more of an underdog type candidate, when I ran in 2016 for U.S. Senate, $135 million was spent on that U.S. Senate election in New Hampshire. $135 million. 95% of the money came from out of state. That money has nothing to do with the needs of New Hampshire citizens. The race was very close, uh, the sums of money very, very large. And when you're subjected to that, that, that kind of sum of money, if you can't at the outset raise it and you don't have it pinned to your back, the media does not pay attention to you. Any issue or any, any position that you might have that is not <laughs> pinned and supported by this type of large sums of money, that issue is irrelevant in the campaign process. So I've been on the losing side of this process. It's horrible. It means that debate is narrowed, the viability of candidates that might be carrying issues that are important, those candidates are not viable. It's horrible for the process of solving problems. It's a contributor to gridlock in the U.S. Congress. Thank you. Uh, we welcome uh, Commissioner Malone, who is on our way through traffic. Thank you, Bopa. Thank you, thank you. And uh, of course, Cheryl's here. Yep. Yes. Uh, any other comments or questions from members of the commission for Senator Rubens? Yes, um, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, you have fascinating testimony, um, Senator, and, and thank you for coming and uh, most welcome. giving us your, your take. Um, and you mentioned that you've been across the country. Um, so I guess it's safe to say that uh, you know, New Hampshire is not like a deep red state. So. I'd like to hear um, some of your observations of, you know, some of the deeper red states that you've been to and, and the reaction you've gotten from some of your Republican brethren in some of those states yeah. and, um, and other, maybe other parties. So I'd like for you to just kind of allude to that. And yeah, I've uh, testified and worked in Texas back when it was totally red. <laughs> And in Missouri, which is very red, uh, in Pennsylvania, I just mentioned Pennsylvania, which is conservative leadership, they were a Democratic governor, but conservative leadership in both their, uh, both their bodies, their House and Senate, and used 
some of the arguments I've used here and have interfaced with leadership in you know, committee leadership and, uh, and, and body leadership in, in, in those states. And <clears throat> this issue has meaning to these folks. It, uh, it's important to come at this issue with, uh, for, for progressives with respect for what motivates con for con conservatives, and, and this issue should not be, should be very, very careful not to make this a progressive issue that we're gonna ram down your throat because progressives are right and conservatives are wrong, and by, by, by getting the 28th Amendment, we're finally gonna get progressive issues uh, and we're gonna suppress conservative, uh, conservative policy objectives. That's very much the wrong way to deal with this. Uh, come, 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 come at these folks with respect for positions and, uh, and the argument that, that, the, the, that some of the principled objectives of Republicans and conservatives, conservatives can be better achieved um, uh, if we uh, restore power to the states. State power is a very important issue to members in, in red states. Legislators in red states really are very, very upset about federalizing elections, power coming in from outside, people in San Francisco and Manhattan uh, selecting candidates and, 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 and choosing members of their bodies. These, these, th that particular issue motivates red state legislators more than I think any other, any other issue that I mentioned there of those five. So it's not, not totally like uh, an economic or a corporate uh, influence um, uh, perspective. It's, it's more like it's an interference. In, outside interference, messing, messing with my state the way, and I'm speaking my in terms, in I'm thinking of a, a red state committee chairman <coughs> or chairwoman, you, if someone in San Francisco coming into my state and picking members of my committee <laughs> and determining which issues are important in my state and who's gonna represent my state in Washington really upsets people. So, so the, that's why I speak about the, uh, the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is there. It's part of the Bill of Rights, and we, we keep hearing about the First Amendment as an objection to, to this, our, this uh, 10th, 28th, 28th Amendment. Well, we've got we to gotta think from a conservative point of view about the 10th Amendment. Very important to people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. And um, full disclosure, I'm president of American Promise when I'm not on the commission and look forward to working with Jim Rubens on our board. Um, but I did have a question for you as well. I think I've, I've seen you on panels and testifying and seen you go wherever the cause takes you to work with progressive Democrats, independents, Republicans, whoever it is. Yeah. And that sometimes seems all too lacking in our American life today. And I, one of the jobs of this commission is to figure out and make recommendations how we move this forward um, together. And so I wonder if you, you alluded to it in terms of you know, encouraging progressives to respect conservative arguments and maybe make some of these conservative arguments um, rather than sort of pounding progressive arguments. But are there other things that you would offer for the commission and, and for, frankly, citizens about um, how you have found it um, yourself able to do what the media tells us we can't do, which is work with people we disagree with, mm. um, you know, talk with people you disagree with, try to accomplish something um, even though you don't agree with somebody. What, do you, what would you have for the commission or, or the people on that? Right, the, the, the right and left are probably not going to agree on how to fix health care. Uh, so that, that should not be the objective of, of what you're doing here with the 20th Amendment. What our objective is is to protect two of the very most fundamental core institutions of the United States, our system of government. People have lost confidence in our system of government. People don't trust it. It doesn't represent people anymore. And it, it's handcuffed. It's stalemated right now. So we have a mutual interest, apart from our particular policy objective, in a government that actually can govern, that can solve problems. The public has discovered that it's not working and has lost confidence. Our system, our, our economic system, our free market economic system, people have pro progressively lost confidence in, in this fundamental uh, institution in the United States. We have a common interest in the prosperity fostered by free market capitalism uh, and pushing back against crony capitalism, which is a direct result of this corrupt big money system. So where we're unified, 
unity among our, our poles of, of, of concern is protecting these fundamental institutions of the United States that are, that, that are predicates of, of, of the freedom and prosperity that we, we enjoy in our country. We have a mutual interest in those things being, being fostered and held up. Well, thank you thank so you much. Yeah. I've got uh, it. Six thirty. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Thank sorry. you very much. And uh, we should move on. I think we'll move on and just ask. Uh, While he's um, handing that out, Scott McDermott, could you mute your phone, please? Thanks. And just um, ask um, uh, subsequent witnesses to keep their remarks uh, as succinct as possible to try to get through uh, as much of the agenda as possible by 7 p.m. tonight. We will have a hard stop at 7 to respect everyone's time. So let's move to the next uh, uh, witness, please. Uh, as of three minutes ago, we were two minutes away. So okay. Is there any second now? Right. Is there someone here who is on um, the agenda? Professor Cunningham. Uh, Professor Cunningham was yeah. next on the list. Right. Uh, uh, Maurice, uh, would you please state your name and your location and uh, your uh, residence, I mean, and we'd be uh, delighted to hear your... Sure. It's Morris Cunningham. I'm an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts uh, at Boston. Um, I had a wonderful lead-in on, uh, on Marty Gillens, but I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll submit that portion of my testimony, uh, which was to be not only on Marty Gillens' research, but a great deal of recent research by political scientists on the impact of uh, money in politics, which is, uh, I think, more frightening in a lot of ways than we think. Uh, but in e to keep it short, uh, as the chairman encourages, I'll just t tell you probably why I'm here. I I've come to research dark money in politics in the last few years. Citizens United brought upon uh, two real curses, I think. One, uh, the vast sums of money we've seen in politics, uh, and also uh, new techniques to keep that money hidden so that the voters don't know who is contributing uh, money. I spent a good deal of my career trying to avoid studying money in politics. Uh, but uh, about three and a half years ago, in a January uh, uh, copy of the Boston Globe, uh, I read a story that um, uh, was about the charters, possibility of a charter school ballot campaign. And the story said that the charter ballot uh, advocates would spend up to $18 million. Now, I didn't know anything about charter schools, but I knew something about Massachusetts politics. 18 million is an extraordinary sum. It's, it's far and away more than, so I began to think, who has that kind of money? Where is this money coming from? And then I found out something else, which was there was no way to find out where that money was coming from. <laughs> so I did. I did. I spent a lot of time researching, and I found out where a great deal of that money was coming from, and I wrote about it. We have a mass politics profs political science blog here in mass and I wrote about it and it made its way into the campaign somewhat never made its way into the mainstream media by the way for the most part um, afterwards uh, the office of campaign political finance our state agency that does a sort of parallel of FEC did conduct an investigation and eventually 10 months after the voters could have used the information because we can't do this during campaigns here in Massachusetts. In September of 2017, OCPF uh, announced a ruling that the big contributor to the Great Schools Massachusetts Ballot Committee, a dark a 501c4, as we heard earlier, named Families for Excellent Schools, would have to register as a ballot committee and disclose their contributors. When that disclosure happened, it turned out a lot of the people I'd been fing fingering were on that list, others were not, but for example, Disclosure. When we run a disclosure ad, we get to see the top five contributors, right? And there was Families for Excellent Schools, Great Schools for Massachusetts, uh, Strong Economy for Growth, tells you nothing. Well, once we got the real disclosure, guess what? It turned out to be four people from Massachusetts and two Waltons from Arkansas, I'll give you six, who put in half, well, eventually went to $25 million. These six people put in half of that money, $12.5 million, all in the expectation that their names would never be disclosed. But it did happen. When you tie together financial firms tied to these other Massachusetts people, you get about another $4 million in dark money. So these are extraordinary sums. This is no way to run a democracy. Um, OCPF kept at it, and eventually we found that in f there were four ballot uh, measures in Massachusetts in 2016 Three of them had been conducted on one side with illegal dark money. One of them from overseas dark money. Right. 
They all lost, by the way, interestingly enough. But uh, this is a real, when you have three out of four of your elections on ballots being conducted illegally, I think it's a crisis. The sums are extraordinary, so there's, there's, there's that aspect of it. I will say one other thing to get back to Citizens United because I want to let other people testify. Um, the only, uh, the big thing in Citizens United, I guess the positive was that disclosure was upheld. Uh, tomorrow in federal court here, there's a case being heard uh, called Mass Fiscal, uh, on a motion by the Attorney General to compel uh, Mass Fiscal Alliance versus Sullivan, Sullivan being the head of OCPF. And what Mass Fiscal is trying to do is to overturn on First Amendment grounds Massachusetts disclosure law. So we may be thinking, ah, at least disclosure survives Citizens United. Don't think the forces behind Citizens United are not out there with the long-term game plan to get rid of disclosure as well. With that, I'll, I'll end my testimony and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for your, uh, for your testimony and for your scholarship, which I think is very uh, informative for us. Um, I, I had a question um, uh, related to OCPF or the state, uh, state regulations. Is there anything that OCPF is not currently doing that you think would be helpful for them to be doing so that we could more closely monitor and have greater transparency, et cetera, or any type of data that you would like to see them provide or collect or otherwise make available that is not currently being uh, collected? I think if I had my wish list with OCPF, the, first, the, the one thing I would like to see them be able to do, and this is the, this is the legislature, they cannot do this. I would like them to be able to make a determination during a campaign when money is coming in. This is done in other states, it's done in Idaho, in another education case down in Idaho uh, in 2014, I think it was, a superior court ruled for disclosure. People, the voters in Idaho got to see who was putting this money in. Voters have an, you know, voters have an absolute right to know what's going on uh, in this. They have a right, and that right needs to be upheld. This money can't be uh, shunted or, or, or held secret behind fancy-sounding names that are oh-so-positive families for excellent schools. Guess what? There are no families. I can give uh, you some, I can give you a ring of, a whole lot of names where there's no, patients for affordable health care, there's no patients. It's a guy from Texas named John Arnold. Enron money. Thank you, Professor. A, a question or two on the constitutional amendment issue um, that would reverse Citizens United in other cases. So Massachusetts once had a law prohibiting corporations from spending money to influence the outcome of ballot initiatives. Um, that was struck down in a case called Bilotti, an early version of yeah. the Supreme Court's current approach to the First Amendment. Um, do you believe Massachusetts people should have a right to limit and exclude corporate money from ballot initiatives or citizens' initiatives? That's been since 1978, but yes, I do believe. So you'd like to see an, amend an amendment that would allow us to make that choice would, would be good? Much, I would very much like to see that, yes. Okay. And you mentioned that six people accounted for over half of a $25 million ballot initiative? That's right. Um, and three of, th three of whom are involved in a... 501c3, to refer back to the testimony of Mr. Curran, that was funding, before any ballot committee was formed, that was funding uh, Families for Excellence Schools, the, the 501c3 version of Families for Excellence Schools in Massachusetts. So this is a long stream of money. There's upstream money and there's downstream money. The upstream money is, is flowing to do the things that Sean Curran was talking about through nonprofit 501c3s. Downstream money for the for the campaign and the ballot committees, but yeah, they they're the source of the money. Okay, so if if six people can have such influence, um, would you support a constitutional amendment that would enable Massachusetts to decide that more citizens should have more influence and therefore allow limits on the money that could be spent by one person or six people? I I do, and I think that is merely echoing what Sean Carwin said and what uh, Senator Rubin said earlier. There's no question about it. Thank you. Would you go so far as to uh, support uh, change that would uh, require contributions to come only from within districts or states or whatever the jurisdiction is uh, affecting a particular issue? I can't say, Commissioner, that I've thought enough about that question at all. I, I, I see the same thing Senator Rubens has seen. I've seen it in a, a house race up here last year, uh, but I haven't put enough deep thought into that question to give you a confident answer. Other commissioners' questions? Okay, let's then move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it.
Uh, the, uh, the next invited testimony is uh, Russell Kaplan. It is 20 minutes of seven. So Mr. <coughs> Kaplan, I'd ask you to uh, please share with us your testimony. Uh, after that, uh, the commission needs to decide our time for our next meeting. And uh, if time allows, we'll do public testimony. Uh, as I mentioned, if time allows. So Mr. Kaplan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I don't have prepared testimony, and that was not discussed with me, but I am I'm prepared to discuss a little bit about uh, the work that went into my book on constitutional brinksmanship, the, how the amendment clause is supposed to work, and then take any questions you might have. Uh, my, my information was that you were interested primarily in two areas, the runaway issue and uh, the story behind the 17th Amendment. And I'll just say briefly that I, I deal with both of those in my book at some detail and would like to point out that when people talk about a runaway convention, they generally conflate and confuse two different issues. Number one is whether Article 5 as drafted contemplates a wide ranging convention or a convention that was taking, well, that would be taking up specific points. And the second question is if, if the constitutional convention under Article 5 is so limited, then can that limitation be enforced uh, as a matter of law? And my answer to both questions is, is yes. If you look at the sequence of the drafting of Article 5 uh, as it was in the Philadelphia Convention, it was uh, or the first working draft, Article 19 of the first working draft of the Committee of Detail on uh, I believe it was August 6th, Philadelphia, uh, the draft said, uh, on the application of the legislatures of two thirds of the states for an amendment of this constitution. And then it, uh, it ended up being a, con a convention for proposing amendments. Uh, and, that, and that clause was specifically to denote what type of convention it was because there were many conventions over a hundred during the colonial and uh, Confederation Revolutionary period, and there were conventions for different types, and you see handbills and documents saying, well, convention for negotiating with the Indians, a uh, uh, convention for dealing with British taxes, or whatever. This is, that's a purpose clause. So the Article 5, as drafted, dealt with uh, a convention that was held to take up specific matters. And, but the uh, the second the second issue is the one I think that concerns uh, most people. What happens if a convention is called on an amendment to reverse Citizens United or uh, the balancing the budget? What happens if the convention is held, proposes the called for amendment, amendment was called for, and then goes overboard, proposes things like you know, banning abortion and other uh, other issues? Uh, and, the, and the thing that uh, the issue that people don't understand is that there are many major checks on that proposal power, beginning with Congress. Every amendment that is proposed, whether it's by Congress itself or by a convention, is transmitted to the states for ratification by Congress, and Congress has to choose the mode of ratification. And obviously, if an amendment is outside the scope, delineated for that convention, Congress is able to just sit on it and not transmit it, and it's, dead, it's a dead letter right then and there. Or, uh, the other way to look at it is to say, well, uh, an amendment, any amendment that comes out of a convention or Congress is just a proposal without the force of law. 38 states need to ratify. <laughs> so it, is, it, it can't overwrite the Constitution. It can't rescind the Bill of Rights. Uh, whatever, it, uh, whatever it turns out, uh, it's only a proposal and needs to be ratified by 38 states. And just as a matter of common sense and the political reality of the situation, any convention that's held under Article 5 is going to generate a lot of public attention. It's going to be hard to hide, you know, an extra amendment. And 38 states have to go along. Uh, and the third is the court system. And this was something not really envisioned by the framers because there was no strong federal judiciary at that time. Article 3. It was just uh, words on paper at that time, but now you have a court system that can uh, handle challenges to an unauthorized amendment. 
issue, it can issue injunctions, it can issue stay orders, it can you know, strike down a specific case that was developed under that amendment. In short, there are several sturdy checks on the runaway convention that people ignore either as a good faith matter of ignorance or fear mongering or political and ideological uh, leanings. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions from uh, members of the commission, either present or on the phone? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. We appreciate that. It's a uh, quarter of seven, and uh, we, so we have 15 minutes left. Uh, we had a person in the public who wanted to testify. We'll, we'll take you. Uh, but then I'm going to ask the commission to take some time to decide the time and place of our next meeting. And then to the extent time is available, would be delighted to have other members of the public offer whatever testimony uh, time allows. Uh, did you want to go? Thank you. Uh, please, your name and uh, Yep. Residence. My name is Sonia Coleman. I'm a resident of Arlington, Mass. And I volunteered to gather signatures <coughs> to qualify the People Govern Not Mon Money ballot initiative in the November 2018 ballot. I've been an activist in gun violence prevention for over seven years. I spent a lot of my time on research to understand why our country is an outlier of nearly 40,000 deaths in one year. Gun violence is a multifaceted issue, but there are a couple uh, clear data points worth mentioning. Our federal gun laws are insufficient and broken. And the NRA, the National Rifle Association, has an overwhelming presence and influence in Congress and now in the White House in 2006, since 2016. If you ask the NRA who their donor, donors are, they'll say American gun, owner, gun owners, but we know differently. Gun manufacturers funnel funds to the NRA under the guise as corporate partners to influence lawmakers on gun reform laws. From the 2011 Violence Policy Center report, Blood Money, How the Gun Industry Bankrolls the NRA, it reveals that in a six-year period from 2005 to 2011, corporate partners' um, donations to the NRA totaled between 15 to nearly $40 million. In total donations to the NRA from all corporate partners representing any industry, um, total from 20 to $52 million. The, mat, uh, the vast majority of these funds, which is 74%, con contributed as corporate partners come from the members of the firearms industry. And those are companies involved in manufacture or sale of firearms or shooting related products. CNN reported last year in Congress, 307 members took and accepted money from N the NRA. Largest contribu contributions over 1 million went to eight members and 39 members took over 100,000 each. 30 million was, went to the 2016 presidential campaign to elect Trump. The outcome of millions of NRA money in Congress is where we are today, where there has been no gun law reform passed in Congress in 25 years. And the NRA's influence to determine our country's gun laws to benefit the gun in industry is no secret. The most recent example, after the August mass shootings in Texas, the current president touted that he must confer to the NRA on what he should support regarding gun law reform, such as universal background checks. And that's what 30 million will buy you. The NRA's interests are counter to what the American people want. PBS polled earlier this month that 83% support federal background checks on all gun sales and 72 support an extreme protective order, which passed in Massachusetts last year. We need to bring Congress back to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Could I ask you, would you mind emailing me that report, blood money for the records for the Absolutely. commission? Thank you. Yep. And also your testimony. Sure. Yes, thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna ask the commission next. Uh, we need to pick a time and a place for our next meeting. And we all know how important it is that we have a quorum. 
so right. that we can take votes and, and otherwise proceed with this important business. I'm going to throw out three possible dates and uh, ask, ask you to tell me what you think is the least inconvenient. Uh, Tuesday, September 24th from 5 to 7. Wednesday, September 25th from 5 to 7. Saturday, September 28th from 5 to 7. And we would ask uh, our hosts at Suffolk if once again we could use this location. So yeah, please check uh, your calendars and... Uh, just point out, uh, I think it's certainly uh, you may consider in scheduling. It's Tuesday the 24th from 11. It'll probably end right around the time service would start at 5. Over in the state uh, legislature is a hearing on the We the People Act, which is going to be discussing exactly this issue using the convention route. Uh, it would be great if any of you would like to attend. And if... Okay. So Sam, why don't you, you know, remind us, and so you have this other event on the 24th, okay. On yeah. the 24th, right. uh, in the Wednesday. Veterans Affairs Commission, our committee, okay. for, uh, starting at 11, is hoping okay. that we'll, we'll get that in a minute. So, both of us, could you guys just check your, your calendars? Wednesday, so we're Wednesday. we're trying to have another meeting in September as opposed to having one in yeah. October. Yeah, well, we, we, there, there will not be a meeting on October 9th. So yeah, there's no uh, meeting October 9th, and we need a meeting with a quorum. We have not had a meeting with a quorum since July. Um, so with these dates, we really need absolute commitments from a quorum, which is eight commissioners. So I think we have to just find the time and commit to it here and now so we make sure we Best get that done. for me is the, uh, Wednesday the 25th. I won't be able to do that one. Hmm? So why don't we just take a poll on each day? Yeah, so I, so I for the 25th. Okay, Bill's okay for the show? I'm looking. The 25th. I won't be able to do the 25th. No. I won't be able to attend the Tuesday or Wednesday. I, don't, I can only do the Saturday. No problem. Um, 20, um, 24th is more open, um, 25th is not, and the 28th is wide open. Okay, so how, what would you think about Saturday? So, so we're three and four. Okay. All right, so we're looking for the least inconvenient. What, do you, what would you think about Saturday, September 28th? I can't do the Saturday. I could do the Wednesday, the 25th. Okay. Anyone on the phone want to chime in on those dates? Hi, this is Scott. I I could do the uh, 24th or the 25th. I can't do Saturday the 28th. I can do Saturday. Can you say Saturday is tough for me, actually. I could do the Saturday. Okay, so again, we're sort of four and four. But, you know. What happened to Monday, the twenty or the twenty fourth? No one could do the twenty fourth. Uh, Tuesday, the twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. Let's go there next. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I can do Tuesday, the twenty fourth. Can you? Me too. No. Yes. You can. Yes. Process no. No. So. I can the twenty fourth. Um, I can make it work. Uh, I can make it work. Tuesday, I can make it work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else are you talking about? Is Scott still on the phone? Scott, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Tuesday, Tuesday. September 24th, 5 to 7. At Suffolk. At Suffolk. Oh, oh. All right. oh. That's election day. Yeah, it's election day. Yeah. It's also the day of this uh, other hearing. Yeah. Right now, it seems to be the only viable option that's going to result in us getting a quorum. The 24th? I think we have to uh, otherwise from we'll, the other we'll, commissioners who are yeah, here, yeah. if that would work. Um, can we do that? You said 5 to 7. Any chance we can do it a little bit earlier on, on Saturday? Is that a possibility? Sure. If we can do it earlier, yeah. Like a 2 to 4, I can do that. Yeah. The earlier, best. I earlier. can make it work. Mm -hmm. I, I will do whatever it takes to get a quorum. <laughs> 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 or like a 12 to 2, something that's a little earlier in the day. Right. I, the 24th is, that's what I do for a living, elections, but I can fit something in earlier yeah. as opposed to the latter part. So give us a time, show. Like 12 to 2? 12 to 2. Oh, yeah. 2 to 4? 2 to 4. 2 to 4. Two to four. Yes. I will make it work. Yeah, 2 to 4, I can switch it. Yeah, I can make it work. 2 to 4 <laughs> on the 24th, I can make Especially it work. Especially if it'll be here. 
Joyce? Yeah, that's on is the that right smack in the yeah. middle of the hearing. It, it is, and I know that Representative Van Peel is probably going to be testifying on the other one. It's it's probably he won't be testifying for that long, so it's probably. It starts at eleven, though, right? That's so like a come and go. It's very close. It's right back and forth. Yeah, it's just right All right, that's just good. I can make that work. Okay, Scott, can you do uh, Tuesday the 24th? We're shooting for 2 to 4 in the afternoon. Yes, I'm, I'm good for that, yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll send a note around to all the commissioners asking them to confirm, but we're going to target that for the 24th. We need to catch up on a lot of our official business. Yeah. Plus, we have loads of more testimony and evidence to accumulate. And reports from the working group. Should we too. put it in our calendar of September 24th, 2 to 4 p.m.? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's hold it. We're getting one hold of those friendly emails on this topic. Yeah. Probably later tonight. <laughs> uh, I just want to repeat the invitation for anyone who wants to go at 11 right nearby. They'd be more than welcome to look at some stuff. But the right. And where's the location, Sam? It's the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Gardner Auditorium. Gardner Auditorium is there. Yeah. yeah. And what time? what's the time? 11 o'clock. 11 to 1. So there it is. Okay, okay uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, we're not going to take any votes, uh, but we do have some five minutes left for members of the public to offer some comment and testimony. Does ever, is there everybody in the room have that interest? Or Raise your hands if you're interested in offering testimony. Oh, we <coughs> so one, two, to three. One or two okay. uh, who has not spoken in front of this group before? Uh, if it, I would give preference to anybody who wants to offer public comment who has not yet spoken in previous meetings. Great. Is there anybody in the room that meets that this criteria? Right here. Come on up, Ezra. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, oops, sorry about that, Kim. Um, so, uh, my, my name is Dan Ezra Ariane Blagen, um, former volunteer with uh, uh, People Govern, gov I guess I'm a current volunteer with People Govern Not Money. I don't really have much to offer. I'm sure you've heard uh, all the stuff before. I just want to offer some comments about uh, um, uh, things that have personally affected me and uh, uh, my friends and family. Um, so uh, the reason I uh, uh, got involved with this, uh, the f when I first got involved with political activism was uh, in 2009 or 10 when my dad admitted to me that uh, he lost $35,000 from his 401k. And uh, I, I, that's when I really started paying attention to the news. And uh, I saw uh, zero um, executives go to uh, jail in this country. Uh, there was one uh, mid-level manager from uh, like uh, Deutsche Bank or Citibank that uh, uh, went to jail in this country. But uh, for example, in Iceland, I saw th uh, 37 bank executives go to jail for their role in the financial crisis. 37 executives and, and not one. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's one. Uh, another is uh, I was recently touched uh, uh, by a friend of a friend. Um, uh, her husband uh, got addicted to uh, uh, painkillers, uh, opioids, Oxycontin, and um, uh, with card crashes and job losses, uh, it, it put an enormal, enormous financial strain on their uh, growing family. Um, and uh, uh, um, number three, I guess I'll uh, just leave off. Uh, in uh, 2017, on uh, uh, April 3rd, it became law, uh, Senate Joint Resolution 34, uh, striking down uh, provisions for the SEC of uh, the protecting the privacy of customers of broadband and other telecommunication services. Uh, this was a bill that no constituent in their right mind would have asked their legislators to put forth to let ISPs sell personal data to advertisers and the government, sell customers' personal data. And, they, and, and, and the House and, and the Senate passed it under the guise of it would give consumers more choice. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, who is next? Uh, I'm David Rosenberg. I live in Norfolk, Massachusetts. I have two fast logistic things. The first is to thank you very much for changing the meeting date from October 9th, which well, that was an oversight on our part. Well, so. well, thank you for asking it. The second logistic issue is that at the uh, Salem meeting, I asked whether everything on the um, shared Google Drive would be publicly accessible, and uh, Mr. Kilmartin told me it would, but it turns out that uh, apparently there are working group folders that are not publicly accessible. In the interest of transparency, I would like everything to be publicly um, 
uh, accessible. Um, the um, substantive testimony I have is basically um, just to reinforce the fact that when this commission was established, um, the act establishing it uh, starts by saying, um, this act establishes a citizens commission concerning a constitutional amendment for government of the people to advance the policies of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, one that inalienable constitutional rights are the rights of individual living human beings and not of artificial entities or aggregations of people. Um, I think that that's very important. I think that I know that the application that each of you had to fill out to become members of the commission um, uh, asked you to um, indicate that you supported that. Um, I thank you for that commitment, and uh, I'd like to remind you that that's really crucial, and I'd like that to be in the recommendation that you issue. Um, and in the interest of brevity, I'll Thank hand you. in the paper. Thank, Thank you. you. There was one more person that, that's going uh, up. Uh, yeah, I, well. <laughs> <clears throat> My name is Paul Lowenstein. I live in Sharon. Uh, I'm a member of We the People of Massachusetts. In the interest of brevity, I think we're out of time here. I've submitted my written comments, and I'll leave it at that. I would just uh, ask that um, those comments be distributed and remind the commission that uh, the link on the business card that's attached to those comments uh, links back to a wealth of information on this topic and it's organized by uh, a folder with the amendment and a folder with the convention so it's easy to find what you're looking for. There's a table of contents within each folder as well so thank you very much. Very Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chairman, I would just take this opportunity to, um, apropos of our work, to uh, wish everyone a happy Constitution Day tomorrow <laughs> and, um, right. and to be uh, grateful or celebrate the fact that it is an amendable Constitution at the very least, so we could take some, some uh, solace in that. But anyway, happy um, birthday to the Constitution tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. We great. have included. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Sam, everybody. Shut down the phone. Thank you for coming. Let me just say a word to Sam, who's worked very hard to get this stuff mic'd up and to get us videoed and recorded. And everybody's contributed a lot, but thank you, Sam.